All right. Um, during worship, the Lord laid some things on my heart that I want to go after and pray for. Um, we're going to pray for physical healing here in a minute. Um, I believe the power of the Lord is present to heal. Let me explain something to you, though, very clearly. Um, when we pray for the sick and we believe that God is going to release healing, this is not just a nice thing that we're doing because we're hoping that you feel better when you leave. Jesus <clears throat> gave the disciples authority to heal sickness and to cast out demons. And then scripture says when they came back, they were rejoicing saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And then I find Jesus' response really interesting, and this is what I want to highlight as we go into this time here really quickly. He said, yes, I saw Satan fall like lightning. When we pray for the sick, we're engaging in an act of spiritual warfare. Because Jesus tied directly the healings and the deliverances and the proclamation of the gospel that went out with the disciples, he directly tied that to principalities being unseated over the region he was in. That's scripture, guys. <laughs> so we're going to go after this. And you've heard me say this before. When we go in and we pray, pray the way Jesus did. And you will notice Jesus never said, Lord, if it's your will, Please, I just ask that you might like, because Jesus knew who his father was, and we're going to talk about this, and like I have a message that we're going to get into. Jesus had hope because he knew who his father was. So his faith was tied to the hope that he had. So engage the faith that you have access to because of the hope of the gospel when we pray. Am I, am I just coming out of the gate swinging and you guys are drinking from a fire hose? Like what's going, I'm getting, I'm getting bug eyes right now, but we're going to go for it. Here's, here's the deal, just to let you in on what's going on with me personally. My family does not get sick, but the last two times that I've spoken, the day, like one to two days before, both of my kids and my wife have gotten sick. So here's the deal. If he's going to take, take a cheap shot at my family, I'm coming out of the gate swinging. So... <clears throat> So I'm going to call out a few different words of knowledge that I feel like the Lord wants to address. Again, I believe that the power of the Lord is present to heal today. I believe that there's, God has released angels into the room on assignment to help release healing. If you have any weird theological stuff about that, talk to me afterwards. I've got a theology degree, which, you know, I can put that to good use. <laughs> so a few things that I heard the Lord highlighting. Chronic migraines, and I'm going to call these out and then I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to go for this. Chronic migraines, panic attacks, and then I don't have any, like, I just saw a general picture for this one. Um, I believe there's some women in here, you've got something going on with your uterus. I don't know what that is, but I saw, like, that's what that was. So if any of those three things are you, I want you to stand up, and we're going to pray for you. You got one. Come on. This is a, I know we're used to models of church where we're like, you know, the guy get the quote unquote anointed guy gets up on stage and he does his thing and we just sit there and watch. I'm very much over that at this point in my life. So you know, anybody else that's chronic migraines, that's stuff going on with your uterus and that's panic attacks. Okay. If you see somebody standing next to you, put a hand on them. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> come Lord come Lord God we bless we bless your healing power that's flowing in the room right now in the name and authority of Jesus I speak to bodies and I command them to be healed I speak to every spirit of anxiety that's bound people and I command that to let go now in Jesus name I declare healing over these bodies. For bodies that um, you've got like chronic stress and anxiety responses, and that's part of what's causing your migraines. I speak to your body and I command it to release tension right now in the name of Jesus. And I command healing to flow. Come Holy Spirit. It's okay if I'm not the only person praying right now. <laughs> that was a nudge. You should start praying. <laughs> hey. 
Father, we speak to every single thing. And God, in agreement, we just say, be healed. Be healed. Keep praying. I'm going to explain some of the dynamics of what's happening right now. But when, again, when we're praying for the sick, there's actually a miniature proclamation of the gospel that goes out in the spirit. Because what we're declaring is that there's a kingdom that has come and is coming that is superior to what is currently governing the world right now. When we pray for the sick, we're declaring that Jesus came, he died, he rose, and he's currently seated at the right hand of the Father. And from that place, we're releasing healing. Because when healing goes out, what it's actually doing is sending a declaration to not only us, but to the spirits uh, of the power of the air, as scripture calls them. It's sending out a declaration and saying, as healing is going out in this room, so will Jesus come back and bring about the redemption of the world. So Father, we command bodies to come into alignment. We command bodies to come into alignment. We command spirits to come into alignment with what you're doing. And we command every unclean thing that has bound your people to let loose and go now. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Um, right here, um, what's, can I get your name? Hannah. Hannah. Um, Hannah, as I'm watching you and as you're receiving prayer, I'm seeing the Lord start to break, um, generational stuff off of you. Um, you've come a long way in terms of just getting to the point where you felt like you could function because of stuff that has happened in your family and previous relationships. But the Lord's actually bringing you into a spot where you're not just going to be able to quote unquote function, but you're going to be able to thrive. You've wondered the, ba the emotional baggage that you felt. You've wondered if you're going to have to live the rest of your life with that. And I'm here to tell you some of it's breaking today, and I'm here to tell you that the Lord actually has freedom for you. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, can you just stretch your hands out to Hannah? So, Father, right now, in the name and authority of Jesus, we declare over Hannah she is not alone. She is not alone. She is not alone. She is seen. She is loved. In the name of Jesus, I command everything in your body to come into alignment with the kingdom. I command, yeah, right there, I command heaviness to lift in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that you're releasing hope into her life. God, I thank you. Again, I just see him uh, just erasing the word lone loneliness, that where you felt alone in what you've been dealing with emotionally, you felt alone in things that you've had to address. You've in many ways had to like grow up too quickly. And I see the Lord erasing that thing over your life. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we declare that she is going to find a family. God, you place... <clears throat> You place the lonely in families. That's who you are and that's what you do. So in Jesus' name, we declare healing, healing, healing of the heart, of your emotions. Um, this too. Uh, you are, and you've known this, you are a feeler. Um, you walked in this morning and you could feel all of everybody else's stuff in addition to your own. And that's made functioning difficult at different times. So just hold your hands out and I wanna pray this over you. Um, Father, right now, in the name and authority of Jesus, Holy Spirit, I call on you to cleanse uh, the emotional bridge that exists between her and everybody else. I command every unclean thing that's attacked you through the relationships that you have and the connections that you've made with people, I command that to lift off and to cease and desist right now in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that every burden that she's carrying that doesn't belong to her lifts now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being brave and letting us go after that. <laughs> That's a lot to have a whole 
room of people. So Holy Spirit, what else do you want to do? I know I want to open this bottle of water. (laughs) Father, we thank you that you're here. You've heard, just to give some context for what's going on in the room, for some of you where this is new, sometimes when we give space for the Holy Spirit to move and minister in certain ways, different people will begin to respond differently. Some people might shout, might laugh, might shake. It's all us responding. It's people's bodies responding to what the Lord is doing in a moment and doing in a room. Scripture is full of accounts where when people encountered the Holy Spirit and saw the Lord, it says they would fall on their face like dead men. Um, all of these different things. When we encounter and experience the presence of God, it is not unusual for our bodies to begin to respond, sometimes in certain ways. It's also not unusual for it not to happen. So just to give context, because as we move today, and some of you are like, what's going on? What's this weird guy doing? Um, we're all on the roller coaster together, Okay. Um, the illusion that can come from people up on the stage is that we know exactly what's going on at any given moment. That is just a flat out lie. (laughs) I did not plan for what we just did today. Um, but God is good and he's the one who leads his church. God is good. He's the one who leads his church. He's the one who leads his body. Thank you, Father. All right, um, we're going to get into some of the message. Don't be surprised if I interrupt myself and we go after something again together. This is just what we're doing today. Are we in? Okay. We're family. We can do this together. Um, So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open to Luke chapter 24. We'll have it on the screen as well. I'm going to begin to, gr- like, I'm sharing this at the beginning of the message because I'm going to sort of ground our discussion today of the gospel and what Jesus, I believe, he's doing in our body, in, like, our body, our context, and then also just the body of Christ as a whole. I'm going to ground it sort of in this story, um, but if you get no other clear message from me today, take this home. The gospel means you have access to hope. The gospel means you have access to hope. And you're like, Aaron, that's cool. Why are we talking about, uh, this is the story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Good question. I will get there. Uh, But we're going to start, and I'm just going to read through this whole passage, um, share some stories. And again, we're we're all on the roller coaster together today. So starting in verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together, they were discussing everything that had taken place. Again, Jesus had just died um, in the passage just before uh, some of the disciples had just seen him resurrected. And while they were discussing and and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them, but they were prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked them, what is this dispute you're having with each other as you are walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. The one named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? And Jesus just gives the most like cheeky answer. He's like, no, what things? (laughs) What things, he asked them. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came and reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. He said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? 
Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them, the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. <clears throat> they came near the village where they were going, and he gave the impression that he was going farther, but they urged him, stay with us because it's almost evening, the day's almost over, so he went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and those who were gathered together who said, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you're doing here today. Help me, Jesus, because I need it. Amen. <laughs> so I want to talk to you today again. The gospel gives you access to hope. And I want to say this too. We often, when we think of the gospel, we think just about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But we often leave off one of the parts that the early church was keen on reminding themselves of every single time they got together, and that's the fact that he's coming back. Why is that important? Because the le like your faith can only rise as high as your hopes. I will say that again. Your faith can only rise as high as your hope. What does that have to do with this? What does that have to do with anything? What oftentimes happens for us in a Western context is when we individualize the gospel so much and we forget about the fact that he's coming back, we, short, we cut the gospel short and we eventually, because we do that, we make it about, okay, I can be forgiven of my sin, I can know for sure that I'm not gonna go to hell, which is super important, that's integral to the gospel, don't hear me incorrectly. But what can happen when we stop the story there is that now the gospel and the Christian life becomes about being saved enough to get to heaven when I die. Here's the deal. If that's the only thing that it was about, why did you not get beamed up when you said yes to Jesus? <laughs> you are still here because he is still coming back. The gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus is not just that you get to go to heaven when you die. It's that he's coming back and bringing heaven to earth with him. Why is that important? Again, if your faith can only rise to the level of your hope, if your hope is caught up in, again, I just get to go to heaven when I die, then your faith can only rise to the level of, God, get me through today so I can just retire from living at the end of my life and go to be with you and forget everything else that's going on around me. Jesus did not live that way. He lived and he talked about all throughout his gospels. He, him returning was one of the things he talked the most about. And here's another interesting point. We often talk about how in the gospels, people missed it. They had their hope and it's even here in the story that we read. They had this hope that Jesus was gonna come and he was gonna restore the kingdom to Israel. He was gonna redeem Israel. Here's the thing, Jesus never told them that was wrong. What he did say was they were missing the point of why he was there. Why is that important? He is coming back to redeem Israel and through Israel, the rest of the world. He is coming back to do that, but he said, there's something I gotta do first. I gotta take care of sin and death first, and then I'm coming back. It's why we have scriptures that say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. The early church was not caught up in this understanding of the gospel that said, sweet, I'm saved, I get to go to heaven when I die, that's it, I'm just going to live my life and try to be a moral person. The way they talked to each other, the way they talked to the rest of the world was, there is a king whose kingdom has come and is being instituted, and he's coming back for the earth that he made. That is the fullness of the gospel. And if we want to talk about church history, that piece of the gospel is why the church got persecuted. Yeah? People don't get threatened by people who think they just have some sort of empowerment to live 
this morally therapeutic life. Like I said yes to Jesus and I get to be a better person. I said yes to Jesus and I get freedom. That's good. That's fine. The kingdom of this world doesn't get threatened by that. It gets threatened by you saying there's a king coming back to displace every other kingdom. We can anchor our hope to that. And if we're talking about historical Christianity, that's what they anchored their hope to. It's not just that he died. It's not just that he was buried, not just that he was raised again. It's not just that you have freedom from sin. It's that he's coming back for the world that he made. The whole story of the gospel, I'll try to condense this. God created a good world. He actually spoke into the midst of chaos. That's the picture that Genesis paints. There's darkness, there's water, there's all this chaotic stuff going on. He speaks into the middle of that and releases light. He releases life. He makes something good. And what's even more on top of that, humanity had perfect relationship with him. It says that when God created man, he breathed into him. He formed him with his hands and he breathed into him. You know what that means? The first thing humanity saw God, this close. God, that close. When Adam opened his eyes, that's what he sees. Perfect relationship with a God who perfectly loves him. And he sets these boundary lines in place. Here's the thing, boundaries, rules, we get all caught up on, you know, like why were there two trees? Why all of this? Here's the deal. Unless there's a choice, love is not real. When I say yes to my wife, when I said yes to a covenant with her, I'm simultaneously saying no to every other woman in existence. And that's the context of love. It's not just, I have all these great feelings about you, let's hang out and see how long this goes. It says, I'm committing now before God to choose you over everybody else. So God sets that up. He says, okay, look, tree of knowledge of good and evil, tree of life. We buy into the lie that the serpent sells us. God's holding out on you. He's not really good. He knows you'll be like him if you take from this tree. The lie that we bought into was that we weren't already like God. We were already made in his image. You're as like, they were as like God as they, were, they could be. We buy into that lie. And because God gave dominion to humanity, he gave them charge over the garden he gave him charge over the creation. In believing that lie, we hand over our authority to the enemy. Sin and death has entry into the world now because of that choice that was made. God immediately launches in. He immediately launches in and says, look, he's talking to the serpent between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will bruise, you will bruise his heel and he will crush your head. From the moment that sin enters into the world, God comes in and has a plan. Through the seed of man, through the seed of humanity, God's going to enter in and he's going to crush the head of the serpent. We follow redemptive history. We see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs, Israel. God is constantly coming and trying to establish a covenant with his people. He's saying, look, there's a way out of this. We can do this together. We can get back to what we had but it could only come to fruition in the person of Jesus. It could only be somebody who could live perfectly, live a perfect life that we could not live, who could live perfectly aligned with the Father, who could live perfectly aligned with the love of God. We had proved through thousands of years of covenant history that we could not do that. So Jesus, God in the flesh, comes in and says, I will do that for you. And then we crucify him. <laughs> All sorts of thoughts on that, but we, human beings, when we see perfect love, as much as we have these great ideas about it, it freaks us out. You're telling me you actually know all of my junk and you still want to be around me? 
here's why that gets scary because you can't control that kind of love. You can't control a person who loves you fully and still knows all of your stuff. That freaks us out. Food for thought. <laughs> Jesus comes, he fulfills everything that's prophesied about the Messiah. Every single thing. He dies and he's resurrected on the third day. Sin and death has been beaten. Scripture says, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? For at this point, the veil's been torn. The thing that separated God and humanity is dealt with. It's gone. It's erased. He ascends back to heaven. He releases the Holy Spirit. He says, for you to actually live like kingdom people, you're going to need me inside of you. You're not, it's not just here, just white knuckle it, try really hard to live a moral life. We've all done that. If you're in this room, it's because you know that doesn't work. <laughs> he says, I need to actually be inside of them to help them do this. You have power inside of you. You have God himself. If you've said yes to Jesus, you have God himself living on the inside of you. You have God, the Holy Spirit. I want to backtrack just a little bit though. This one isn't on a slide, but John 17, we get this glimpse into the prayer life of Jesus. He knows he's about to head to the cross. He knows he's about to die. Historically speaking, the most gruesome, painful, terrifying death that has ever been devised. He knows that's where he's headed. So getting a glimpse into that moment of his prayer life, you get to see what's most important to a person. He's talking to God and he says, Father, I desire that those you gave me would be with me where I am. Father, I desire that those you gave me would be with me where I am. That they would be one as you and I are one. Scripture says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. You are that joy. Self-hatred has no room to exist in that. Most of the time, self-hatred is just self-flagellation. It's our attempt at beating ourselves into submission to a rule that we think we have to obey, when in reality, the power of the gospel, the Holy Spirit inside you says, look, I know you can't do this. What if I gave you grace to do it? There's hope here. Father, I desire those you gave, gave me would be with me where I am. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. We're gonna, I think we're skipping ahead a little bit in the slide, but I want to read Revelation 21. This is at the very end of Revelation. John's, after all the judgment, all of everything's been released. This is the culmination it says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. He also said, right, because these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. The one who conquers will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cowards, the faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Here's the deal. If we cut the gospel, one of the reasons why I love the miraculous, why I love healing, isn't just because I like supernatural stuff. It's because 
we're actually proclaiming to the world, to the spirits of the power of the air, to principalities and powers, we're declaring Jesus is actively redeeming the world and he is coming back for his creation. Aaron, you keep saying, you know, your faith can only rise to the level of your hope. Where are you getting that? That sounds really nice, but give me some scripture on that. I'm glad you asked. I'll do that right now. Hebrews 11.1. 1. If you've been in church for any length of time, you've heard this. Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. Can I get really nerdy with you guys for a hot second? <laughs> so when we understand, and follow me here, this is all going to tie in, the Trinity is a really baffling concept, Right? If you're not nodding your head, you haven't spent much time thinking about it. <laughs> it's something that the early church spent the first three to 400 years of its life trying to parse out. People who are way smarter than you and I will ever be devoted their lives to how do we talk about the Trinity? How do we talk about this God who's three in one? How does that make sense? How does that work? The best way that we could describe this part of it, and again, this is a much larger conversation, but I'm going to give you a piece right here. When we get into Greek, the way the church fathers described it is God is three persons, one essence. Into Greek, it's three hypostases, one usia. There's this thing that happens when you start talking Greek from the stage. People's brains just go... <laughs> is the, and you can check online later if you want, faith is the hypostasis of things hoped for. Faith is, when you get down to the root of it, it is the core thing that hope expresses itself through. To put it another way, faith is the thing that makes hope more than wishful thinking. Your faith can only rise to the level of your hope because your faith is the reality of that thing that you're hoping for. So if all you're hoping for is to just skate through life because it's so dark, so hard, maybe I'll just get to heaven when I die and say, sayonara to everybody else, have fun dealing with that. I'm gonna go float on a cloud and play a harp for Jesus. <laughs> if that's the culmination of your hope, your faith can only rise to the level of God get me through today and help me to just skate through the rest of life. If your hope is anchored to a God who's coming back to redeem the world and set everything right, your faith can then rise to the level of, I don't know, God, what you're doing right now. I don't understand why there's so much pain and suffering in the world. I don't understand all this emotion that's going on with me. I don't know like what's wrong with me. I can't seem to straighten myself out, but I know you're coming back. I know you're coming back for a pure and spotless bride. I know you're coming back for your people. And at that point, your faith can rise to that level. Here's another important point. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Aaron, why are you talking about this? Well, number one, it's true. <laughs> and number two, as I've been praying, seeking the Lord over God, what, what are you doing? What's coming up in this next season? The, the sense that I keep getting, and I'll just walk you through this whole prophetic thing that I'm sensing. Um, the enemy would love for us to be lulled into a sense of security now that most of us are just starting to feel that we're starting to put COVID behind us for the most part. Here's the deal. At that point, if your hope is grounded in that thing, then the moment anything else hard comes your way, you're in a swirl. The picture that I saw was of just a group of people. It was simple, it was quick. I saw a picture of a group of people and this massive flood came through. And there were some people who got washed away in it and there were some people who had a raft built and were able to ride that thing into the next season. And as I was talking to the Lord about it, that raft is hope. And here's the deal. 
it's the same circumstance. The same circumstance will cause one person to spin out and one person to get propelled into the next thing that God has for them. The difference being, where is your hope anchored? Where is your hope anchored? The disciples on the road to Emmaus, they told us very clearly where their hope was anchored. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to come redeem Israel. Their hope wasn't in a person. Their hope was in a specific outcome. And if 2020 did anything, it revealed for us where our hearts were tied to a hope that was in a specific outcome and not to a person. I was super guilty of that. My family and I, we... You ever get really arrogant and just think, like God gives you this much and you think you know this much? <laughs> that was me in 2020. We had just come off of staff here. We had joined YWAM. I thought I had the next 10 years of my life figured out because God gave us one bit of direction. He said, join YWAM Kona. They need fathers and mothers. And I was like, sweet. And I like through praying and all this other stuff, I'm like, cool. We're going to end up in Germany. We're going to help this base in Berlin. We're going to do all this stuff. It's going to be awesome. And then one fateful Friday comes and they say, the world is shutting down. We need to send you home. Confused, disappointed, my hope was in an outcome. If we can learn to hold things open-handed because God is constantly working. And here's something to the disciples on the road to Emmaus they were so disappointed and so caught up in their hopes being dashed, they didn't recognize Jesus. You think about that? He was right there. Something else to point out too. It wasn't when he gave them answers to their questions that they recognized who he was. So many of us, ha like our hopes have been dashed. We've got all this confusion going on and we think, man, if God would just answer these questions, I'd be good. Jesus knows what we need more than we know what we need. It wasn't him answering their questions that brought them back into hope. He explained, look, this is where your hope got off. But then it was in that moment of fellowship where he's breaking bread. That's the moment where their eyes get opened. The antidote to healing to a past season is not getting answers to the questions that you have. It's looking back and realizing he didn't leave you. He didn't leave you and he's not going to anytime soon. Everybody could stand. We're going to close it here because I could just keep talking, but. <laughs> and if I could actually have the prayer team come up now. Um, there's two groups of people that I believe the Lord's highlighting right now. And the first is you don't know Jesus and you need to believe the gospel. You need to repent and you need to give your life to him. You need the hope that Jesus has to offer. And what's more, you want to be a part of the kingdom that's coming. Because this isn't just a social club. This is a group of people who are standing in faith saying, I know that my king is coming back for me. He's coming back for this world. And the second group of people, the Lord's just like digging in on your heart and saying, my hope has been very much grounded in something other than God himself. Or it could just be, Father, my hope's been really short-sighted. 
I was living in a way to just like help me skate through, help me just get through this life. I'll go to heaven when I die and that'll be good enough for me. God's inviting you to say, get your hopes up. Say, Aaron, last time I got my hopes up, I got really disappointed. That'll happen. When that does, we oftentimes turn to cynicism because that feels safer. Here's the deal. You won't find cynicism in God. So you can hold on to that cynicism, keep your heart all boxed up, but at some point you have to recognize it's not in God, so why is it in you? So if any of that is you, I want you to just come down to the front. Whether you need to say yes to Jesus for the first time, whether you need to say, Holy Spirit, I need you to upgrade my hope. I need you to get me in line with what the gospel actually is. Come on down. Somebody already came, see? You don't have to do the awkward thing of being the first one down the aisle. I'll pray for us so that you might uh, feel a little bit more comfortable walking down here. Father, in Jesus' name, I bless every heart. Father, pull us into hope. Father, we repent for where we've had our hopes too low. God, anchor us into your story. Anchor us into your story. Anchor us into the reality of a God who's coming back for his people. Anchor us into the reality of a God who loves his people so much that he couldn't stay away. I'm going to open it up to you. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed as I keep praying. But some of you, like, you may not feel like you identify with anything I called out, but you're feeling the Lord on you right now. That could be your emotions, that could be the presence of God in a way that you didn't, like, are not used to feeling. If any of that's you, please come down. Um, it's not because we want, like, it looks better to have a full altar. It's because we want to agree with what God's doing in you. So please, if any of that's you, come down. So Holy Spirit, we thank you. Father, I silence condemnation in this room, in Jesus' name. I silence also the voice of disappointment in the name of Jesus. Father, we choose to say, God, here's my disappointment and I don't understand, but you take this. Thank you, Holy Spirit.